But it's good to be uh, it's good to be back out and it's my first opportunity of getting to to see the church and so it is lovely and can i thank those who work so hard to uh, to bring all the offerings of fruit and veg and decorating the windows they just look uh, look lovely i think tomorrow morning is we team or as big a team as there could be perhaps uh, to uh, to distribute uh, what has been uh, donated to different homes around our community. So if you're available to help with that, that would be great. So thank you, thank you ahead of that. Thanks also to the choir who have been practicing and working so hard. Uh, it's just great and we're looking forward to your ministry to us tonight. I want to uh, welcome our speaker, the Reverend Kerr Graham. Uh, Kerr, I was at his church a couple of weeks ago. They had an afternoon harvest and it's lovely to be able to return the favor. So thank you, Kerr. Really good to have you. Uh, we will swap over at a point in the service, and uh, uh, it'll, be, it'll be good. Just can I say there's not really any announcements except to say that there is a cup of tea after the service, so please stay straight across the road and into the hall. Uh, you get a cup of tea. And any parents who uh, wanted to get a catechism, uh, I wasn't here this morning, so I brought a few catechisms tonight for our children's address slot. So they're here, I brought those tonight if you want to see me. And another, just a, a last harvest announcement. We are doing a food bank appeal to coincide with our harvest. So there's a trolley at the door. Great to see that trolley being filled up. So items are being deposited into there and then sometime after next week, we will donate that to a food bank. So thank you in anticipation of all of that. Psalm 67, verses 6 to 7 says, The land yields its harvest, 
God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. We'll sing our first hymn, wonderful hymn, How Great Thou Art. <coughs>
Amen. Good singing. Let's pray. Father, on the occasion of our harvest service here in Rothfair Island, we turn to you with hearts full of thanksgiving. All around us are placed uh, visual reminders of your kind provision to us. We can say with the hymn writer, all that we have needed, your hand has provided. And yet your greatest provision was not to meet our physical appetite. It was to satisfy our spiritual needs of love and forgiveness. It's why you sent your son. Just as we've been singing this evening, Lord, and when I think he sent his son, not spare. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Our greatest need you met when you died on the cross to pay the price, the penalty that our sin incurred. So we, we thank you for that. We thank you for our food, for the blessings that we have every day, but we thank you for Jesus. And it's from our heart we want to worship you this evening and acknowledge you in this place and give you the honour and the glory that you deserve. And so just as tonight and tomorrow and every day we're going to feed on what will satisfy our physical hunger, so too we ask that you would enable us to feed daily on your love and continual pardon offered to us in Jesus Christ. You are the bread of life. You are the living water. And so may we respond in faith to your invitation to come to you and drink. Lord, receive from hearts of gratitude, thanksgiving for the indescribable gift. And our prayer is, Lord, that you would continue to work your work in each heart and life. And that includes your pardon for our sins. Forgive us where we have sinned, O God, even this week where we have transgressed in thought, in word, in deed. O God, cleanse us, we pray, from all unrighteousness and continue with us in mercy and grace. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So the choir have been busy. They've been working hard, practicing for the past number of weeks. They're going to sing uh, one, uh, one of their pieces now, Timeless Love.
lovely. We're going to stand and sing now. Uh, Jesus is Lord, creation voice proclaims it. Part of our worship here, uh, whether it's Sunday morning or Sunday night, is giving thanks for the offering. Or part of our worship is is giving the offering. And so we're going to pray and dedicate what has been given tonight to the Lord. And so uh, that, along with our our prayer requests, uh, our prayers of intercession, and those are where we are encouraged to bring those needs of ours be it private, be it personal, be it a need in our family or further afield, we bring them to the Lord and we ask him for his help in our time of need. So I'm going to ask John if he'd come up with the offering and, uh, and I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you that you invite us to come. To come to you with confidence to bring our requests and our needs to you to ask for help Lord when we need it and so Lord uh, throughout our gathering uh, as each person is represented as a home is represented as a family and a wider family circle Lord as our faces differ so do our needs and so we bring them to you now just in the quietness of our own heart. And whether it's sickness that has come, a diagnosis that we're struggling with, a bereavement that still stings even after many years, perhaps it's a difficulty at work, perhaps as a challenge at school, something that is just beyond us 
and we need your help with. Lord, we ask for that help now. Even as we draw near to you, O God, in faith in this moment, we pray, as James says, that you would draw near to us in grace and kindness. And in so doing, in this moment, lift heavy burdens and answer prayers and meet needs, we pray. We thank you for the needs that you have met. Lord, we only have to look back over the course of our lives and we can see answers to prayer all through our journey. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you, Lord God, even for meeting our physical appetites. To that end, we want to uh, give you thanks for the harvest this year. It has been a good harvest and the weather has been favorable to get it in. We give you thanks for that. You are, yes, the Lord of the harvest of people, but you're also the Lord of the harvest of fruit and veg and those things that go on our table every day. So, so thank you, Lord. And we pray that you would continue to be with our farming community. Bless them and help them to do their job, we pray. We ask you for our world at this time. Lord, our world is a world of war. There is trouble and chaos that fill our news. But you are the Lord of the nations. You are the king of this world. And we pray, O oh God, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done in troubled areas so that the grand master plan that you have for this world would come to pass. And wherever there is war, we pray that you would bless and strengthen your people in those places and pray that you would enable them to uh, be a witness for you where they're placed, be that the Middle East, be that Ukraine, be that wherever there's war or trouble, be that in places where your church is persecuted and not allowed to meet openly. O oh God, be with your people, we pray. We thank you for our gathering here tonight. It's just wonderful to meet, to raise our voices, to sing, to have the freedom that we have. Lord, we thank you for it. And we thank you, Lord, that we can put our hands in our pockets and return our worship to you in this tangible way by putting an offering on a plate. It is an act of worship. We pray it would be worthy of you. We ask that it would be used wisely and well by this church, Lord, to uh, bring your kingdom here in this locality and further afield. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. choir are going to sing their second piece or their third piece now uh, O Lord our Lord
enjoy the singing tonight. It's been great. We're going to sing one more before we invite Care to come up. Uh, we ply the fields and scatter. I add my thanks to the choir for their leading in worship and their input to that this evening and also to all who helped decorate the meeting house for today. Uh, sometimes we say we thank the ladies for that but we get ourselves into trouble because there's a gentleman usually somewhere and I'm sure that's true in Rathbury Island as well. So I thank you for the reminder of all God's grace and bounty to us over the past year. And it's also good to shame us down in the Groves congregations in North Monaghan I'm one of those rare beings that are cross-border, uh, one in South Armagh and then one also uh, just over the border in County Monaghan. And it was good that Seamus and Helen down with us at that. Now let's read together from God's Word. If you have your Bible with you, then please do turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. And we'll look together at verses 19 through to 24. Matthew, chapter 6. Commencing reading at verse 19, this is God's word. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Amen. We end at verse 24 and give thanks to God for this reading from his word of truth. Harvest time is always an opportunity for us to reevaluate our lives. Yes, we look back in thanksgiving to God for his gracious provision for us over another year. But as we think of how we've been blessed, I wonder what it is that you value most in life. As you think of what you have acquired, as you think of what you've saved up to buy, as you think of all your possessions and all that you have, what is it that is really important to us? I'm sure if we've been frankly honest with ourselves, then we'll say that what we value most are those earthly possessions those material blessings that we've worked hard to acquire. And yet the propensity to build our lives around possessions is especially great. Sure as we look out around our world, we see so much that we long for and we're never ever satisfied. But then with such an attitude, what's new? Whenever we turn to the Word of God this evening and turn to Matthew 6, we find that the leading religions of Jesus' day were preoccupied with possessions. They were materialistic. They were greedy. They coveted what belonged to their neighbors. They were grasping. They were manipulative. And Luke, as he writes in his gospel in chapter 16, verse 14, tells us that the Pharisees were lovers of money. And that was not incidental to their sins for which Jesus rebuked them. Here in these Pharisees, are a group of men who did not have a right view of themselves. Neither did they have a right view of their relationship to the world. They did not have a right view of Almighty God. They did not have a right view of morality. They did not even have a right view of their religious duties. How then is it possible for them to have a right view of material possessions? And as we recall Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees, we're reminded that false doctrine leads us to false standards. And false standards leads us to false behavior and false values. Hypocritical religion has always been accompanied by greed and immorality. The great late Church of England theologian and rector Dr. John Stott writes, that worldly ambition has a strong fascination for us. This spell of materialism is very difficult to break. He goes on to remind us that the Apostle Paul established a proper attitude when he wrote that godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we've brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of it. If we have food and clothing, with these we should be content. Well, let's turn our thinking back then to Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. Three things we want to notice this evening. Firstly, this, a single treasure. A single treasure. As we read these verses of Scripture tonight, I believe it's clear that Jesus is not advocating, neither is he teaching poverty as a means to spiritual, spirituality. In all of Jesus' many teachings and instructions, only once did he tell a man to sell all that he had and to give his money to the poor. And he did that because this man's money, this man's possessions, this man's wealth had become his God. But rather as we read our way through the Old and New Testaments, surely they recognize the right of the individual to material possessions, provided that those possessions have been acquired by fair and honest means. Think of Father Abraham. He was a man of great wealth, wasn't he? 
He was a man, we might say, that hobnobbed with the kings of Canaan. Think of Job. Job was another man of great wealth. He was stripped bare of everything he had. But yet we know that later on God blessed him and made him even wealthier still. So surely financial poverty or ruin is not something that Jesus is advocating. Verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Do not lay up. I'll see if shame is the embarrassment and asking what the Greek term is there. <laughs> You're, you're sweating, aren't you? <laughs> therazzo. Therazzo. Do not lay up therazzo from where we get our English term thesaurus, meaning a treasury of words. And here in this Greek, it carries the idea of stocking out or laying out horizontally many, many coins. And in the teaching of this passage, the idea of stockpiling or hoarding wealth is that wealth which is not being used. And Jesus is saying that when we stockpile earthly possessions, they're in grave danger of becoming a spiritual hindrance to the believer. In ancient times, wealth was frequently measured, at least in part, by clothing. Garments back in New Testament days represented a considerable investment. But rich people would often get threads of gold, threads of silver, and they'd have them woven into their garments. And that not only displayed their wealth, but it also kept their wealth safe. But of course there's a problem. Because the best of garments were made of pure wool. And we know how moths love to chew their way through wool. And so the point is that not even the rich could safeguard their wealth from corruption. Wealth is also measured in part by grain. And yet grain, whenever it's stockpiled, becomes subject to attack by vermin. And then there are those other possessions of great value. And they were often taken out and they were hidden in a field. And how often in Israel today, Archaeologists continue to make great finds as they find possessions and things that people had buried away back in Bible times. And even those possessions that we do look after, and even those possessions that we safeguard in our lifetime, one day we're separated from a death because there are no two bars on a hearse. Surely then we see clearly what Jesus is speaking about as he challenges us about a single treasure. This single treasure is salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Later on in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter reminds us that salvation, this single treasure, is kept for us safe in heaven by the power of God where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And in case we miss the point, in chapter 2, he goes on to give us that invitation. Come to him. Come to the living stone. And I wonder this harvest 2024, what are you trusting in? What is it that you're living your life for? Is it for that which shall never spoil or fade or be taken from us? Salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone? Or are we still captive by the things of this world? And that from one day from which we were separated from. The single treasure is the love of God in Jesus Christ displayed in Calvary's cross. As Christ was nailed to the cross to carry the punishment and the sin, and the punishment that we deserve for our sin. If only we'd come and decommission our sin and place it upon the great sin bearer. A single treasure. But notice secondly, not only a single treasure, but a single vision. 
single vision. Look at verses 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eyes are clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Notice, will you, how these verses expand upon the teaching of the previous three. And it is now the eye that becomes the illustration of the human heart. The lamp or the lens of the body is the eye through which all light comes to us. It's the only channel of light that our bodies possess. It's our only means of vision. The heart then is the eye of the soul through which the illumination of every spiritual experience shines. It's through our hearts, the very core of our being, that God's truth and love and peace and every other spiritual experience comes to us. And when our hearts are redeemed by Christ, when our hearts, our spiritual eyes are clear, then our whole body will be full of light, the glorious light of the gospel of grace. But Jesus warns us that when our hearts and when our eyes are bad or diseased or damaged, then no light can enter and the whole body is full of darkness. One theologian describes it like this. He says that the idea behind this passage is one of childlike simplicity. The eye is regarded as a window by which light gets into the whole body. He says that the color and the state of a window decide what light gets into a room. If the window is clear, clean, and non-distorted, light will come flooding into the room and illuminate every corner of it. But if the glass of the window is colored, or frosted, or distorted, or dirty, or obscure, then the light will be hindered, and the room will not be lit up. So then says Jesus, the light which gets into any man's heart and soul and being depends on the spiritual state of the eye through which it has to pass. For the eye is the window of the body. How are your eyes this evening? Your spiritual eyes? How is your heart? Has it been cleansed by the once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross? Or is it that tonight you still, you know the gospel, but you know in your heart of hearts that you're still not converted? And maybe it is there are things that are going on in your life that are causing difficulties. Maybe you're harboring resentment or grudges or rebellion or apathy. There's something that's keeping you away from Jesus. Something that's keeping out the light of his wonderful salvation. We all have got our pet hates, don't we? One thing I dislike is to sit in a room and look out through a dirty window. And we take action, don't we? We either send for the window cleaner or else we're dispatched by our wives to go and to clean the windows. Usually it's raining, isn't it? But it's strange that so many don't like to look out through dirty windows. And yet still myriads of people, even in Northern Ireland tonight, are content to live in spiritual darkness with their hearts not knowing the cleansing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we miss out on life. We miss out on love. We're in danger of missing out on God's grace and eternal life in heaven. For it's by grace you're saved through faith, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. How this evening we need to that single vision to lift our eyes to behold Calvary, to behold the Lamb of God who was slain from before the foundation of the world. To see there again clear at the cross the offer of forgiveness no matter what we have done. Jesus longs that we come, that we repent of our sin, that we turn around, that we place our sins in the great sin bearer. We come to embrace him as our Savior, as our Master, as our Lord, as our all. Do you have clear vision this evening? A single treasure, a 
single vision. But then thirdly, verse 24, a single master. A single master. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And surely what Jesus is saying to us here is that just as we cannot have treasures on earth and in heaven, or our bodies full of light and darkness, so we cannot serve two masters. The Greek term for master refers here to a slave owner. And so by definition, a slave owner has total and utter control of a slave. And for the slave, there's no such thing as part-time obligation to the master. The slave owes full-time allegiance and full-time service to his full-time master. The slave is owned. He's totally controlled by his master. And if that slave were to give any other time or any other thing to anybody else, then that would make his master less than his Lord. And so it's utterly impossible for us to serve two masters because either we hate the one and we love the other or we hold the one and we despise the other. And over and over again in the New Testament, it speaks to us of Christ being our Lord and Master. If you're a believer, then you are his bond slave. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6 that before we were saved, we enslaved the sin which was our master. But we came and trusted Christ, we became slaves of God and slaves of righteousness. And so if Jesus is your Lord, then he must be Lord of all. Or he's not Lord at all. We cannot serve two masters any more than we can walk in two different directions at the same point in time. It's impossible. And so this harvest time, who is it we're serving? Who is our master? Because the answer that we each give to that question carries with it eternal consequences. The one who saved by faith seeks to do everything for the glory of God. They're able to cry out to the psalmist of old, I have set the Lord continually before me. Are you in Christ? Or outside of Christ? Saved or unsaved? Converted or unconverted? Joshua gave the people a challenge. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. And then he spoke of the wonders of household salvation. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who are we serving this evening? Is Jesus Lord of all? Or are we still falling between two opinions? Lift again your eyes to the cross this evening to realize what God has done for you and for me. That He so loved you that He poured out His love on the cross of old, longing that we had returned that love by turning in repentance on the Christ, the Savior, and as Lord of all. One of our wonderful hymns says, Bearing shame and scoffing rude, In my place condemned he stood, Sealed my pardon with his blood. And our response, Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray together. Our Father, this evening we thank you for the fresh opportunity of being able to come on the sound of your word this evening. We thank you for your word and we bless you that your word is truth. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we come on to the searchlight of your Holy Spirit, that you challenge us each at the point where we stand in our need of Jesus this evening. 
Father, we thank you that this is still the day of grace, the day of opportunity, the day when again we can call out upon the name of the Lord, knowing that when we call upon the name of the Lord in sincerity and truth, then we shall be saved. Fathers, we bless you for that wonderful salvation. And as we give thanks for the physical harvest, so we long for a spiritual harvest. We long again for this land, north, south, east, and west, to resound the praises of Zion. So, our Father, speak to us and challenge us and give deciding grace this evening so that all the praise and all the glory and all the honor might be ascribed to Jesus and to him alone. For it's in that lovely and wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Our final hymn this evening is Creation Sings the Father's Song. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen.